The scripture reading this morning will be from Acts chapter 25, starting in verse 23 through uh, verse 1 of chapter 26. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice uh, amid the great pomp, amid great pomp and entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my, to my lord. Therefore, I have brought him for you and all, uh, you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. Agrippa sent, said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for, for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. Please be seated. Mark your songbooks number 297 for the song of invitation. 297. Just a matter of a very few weeks ago, I would have denied if anyone would say the words that are about to come out of my mouth. But if you're on Facebook like I am, And I want to tell you, I just about choke on those words. <laughs> but if indeed you are on Facebook like I am, you might have seen a post by my younger daughter, Meredith, wherein she wrote about the day that she was baptized into Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, Sister Laura Wiscozy also made a similar post. I have not notice, do not know if anyone else has as well. But because I had fallen away from the Lord, and because not only did I not get to baptize Amber and Meredith into Christ as I had always dreamed I would, not only did I not get to baptize them into Christ, I wasn't even present when they obeyed the gospel didn't learn about their obedience to the gospel until some time after the fact. And as strange as it may seem, for whatever reason, I never really asked either one of the girls about that day when they obeyed the gospel. And so when I read Meredith's accounting of the day that she was baptized into Christ, I read it with great relish and with great interest. I was fascinated by it, but it filled my heart with joy just to read about it. You know, all of us like to hear stories. We like telling people stories. We tell our friends, we tell our relatives, we will even tell strangers if they'll listen to us. We'll tell them our story or tell them a story. What is really kind of interesting in a peculiar way to me is how few times we tell our story of salvation. How very few times that we find someone and we ask them, could I tell you how I came to be a child of God? Can I tell you about the day that I was added to the body of Christ and I was saved from my sins. We don't tell people that story very much, do we? 
And as a result of Meredith writing out an account of her day, the day that she was baptized into Christ, I'd like for us to just look at that particular thing this morning. What is your story? And if you would get your Bibles out, because I am not including the scripture references on the screen like I normally do, but please get your Bibles out and turn to Acts chapter 26. Our lesson today will be entirely in the chapter 26 of the book of Acts where Paul stands before King Agrippa and Paul tells King Agrippa his life story in his defense. You remember that Paul had been arrested. He had been falsely accused by the Jews. They wanted to put him to death. And it was necessary, as Brother Landon read just a moment ago, for Paul to appeal to Caesar just to save his own life. And he was waiting transport to Rome when he was brought before King Agrippa. And in offering his defense to King Agrippa, all that he did was he just simply tell, uh, told Agrippa his story. I want us to recount that story as Paul referred to it in the hearing of King Agrippa and others there. We'll begin reading in Acts chapter 26 and in verse 2 where the Apostle Paul tells Agrippa about his life before Jesus Christ because that's where our story begins, isn't it? All of us. All of us, all of our stories begin of life before Christ. Beginning in verse 2, reading down through verse 11. In regard to all things, all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews, Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now... I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. And not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme and being furiously enraged at them, I kept persecuting them even to foreign cities. The Apostle Paul began his defense to Agrippa by saying, you know what? If these fellows here, my fellow countrymen, my fellow Jews in the flesh, if they would be honest about it, they would tell you that I was born a freeborn citizen of Rome. I was born of an aristocratic Jewish family. And not only that, but I was a member of the strictest sect of the Jews, a Pharisee. If they would be honest in telling the story about me, Agrippa, what they would tell you is that no one had a greater fervency and was a greater school in the law of Moses and the prophets than me. I had a zeal toward God unparalleled by any of my fellow Jews. And not only that, but King Agrippa, 
I used to sit right where you're sitting right now. Not in that judgment seat. What I mean by that is, Agrippa, I used to hate this fellow Jesus as much as you and your entire family. You know, your entire family's history centers around trying to do away with this guy named Jesus. Your great granddaddy was the fellow that had all the, the male infants, two years and younger, destroyed there many years ago, trying to make sure that this promised Messiah that supposedly was born there in Bethlehem was destroyed. And all of your family thereafter has followed that same road of seeking to do everything they could to wipe out this fellow named Jesus and anybody who would be a follower to him. So I know exactly how you feel toward him because I used to feel the same way. I was a typical kid. That might be hard for you to believe. But I was pretty much a typical child. Sunday morning, I woke up when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. Woke up every Sunday morning trying to think of an excuse that my mother would buy into why I couldn't go to church that morning. And I just wasn't smart enough to outsmart her, and so I had to go pretty much every Sunday. I didn't listen to the preacher. As a matter of fact, I sat way at the back of the auditorium behind my mother so that she couldn't see me. That way I could just kind of slump down in the seat and get me a little nap. While Gus Hayworth, who was the first preacher that I heard in the East Side Baptist Church, he was followed by Albert Martin. And please don't ask me why I can remember those two names and I can't remember your name, but that's just the way that it goes sometimes. But Gus Hayworth and Albert Martin were the two preachers that I listened to while attending Eastside Baptist Church, except when I say I listened to them, I really didn't. But I saw one Sunday my mother and my brother going down the center aisle when the invitation song was being sung to confess that they were sinners and that they had received Jesus Christ into their hearts and had been saved from their sins. It wasn't too long after that, maybe just a couple of three months, that I saw my dad and my mama's sister, Aunt Gee, going down the center aisle, confess that they were sinners, that they had received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I was sitting all slumped down when the invitation song was sung, and all of a sudden I see my sister going down the center aisle. Well, now that got my attention because that's the last one. I mean, if I don't go with her, that means I'm going to have to go down there by myself sometimes. So I just jumped up there and went right on down there with my sister, confessed as a sinner, received Jesus Christ and through my heart as my personal Savior. Didn't change one thing about my life. When I was at school with my friends, I still used bad words, still told dirty jokes, listened to dirty jokes. I was raised on a farm in Temple, Texas, and when we, in the summertime, would go into, the, into town on Saturday, I'd go to town, I'd go over to the local newsstand, I'd sneak kind of over into the back part of the newsstand to look at the girly magazines. Sneak back out. I smoked at great peril. I just did all the normal things that normal person does even though I claimed that Jesus Christ had saved me from my sins. That was my manner of life before Jesus. The Apostle Paul in standing before Agrippa said, well let me tell you about the very moment that I met Jesus. Because this Jesus that I hated so much, this Jesus that I was infuriously enraged against, this Jesus whom I hated so much that I even tried to make those people who were followers of Him, who were His disciples, I tried to make them blaspheme the very name by which they had been saved. But you know what, Agrippa? I was on my way down to the city of Damascus. I had letters in my hand of authority 
given to me by the chief priest so that if I found any of those people who were disciples of Christ, then I could bind them and I could bring them back to Jerusalem. Let's read together verses 12 through 18. He says, so, While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, that I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you. To appoint you a minister and a witness. Not only to the things which you have seen. But also to the things which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes. So that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. I was on my way down to Damascus King and this, this light, and in another accounting of Paul's conversion, this light was at noontime. This light, the glory of Jesus, outshone the noonday sun. The sun when it's at its zenith and when it's at its brightest. And the glory of Jesus was even brighter than that. And it caused all the people, not only Saul of Tarsus, but the whole company that was with him, it caused them all to fall to the ground. And then all of a sudden Saul heard this voice, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Don't you know that you're fighting against God? Don't you understand what you're trying to accomplish here? And he says, well, who are you in the first place? And he said, well, I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you hate so much. I'm the one that you have been trying to just stamp out any remembrance of whatsoever. And you've been persecuting me, Saul, not me personally. I'm here in heaven. But those who are my disciples, my followers, you have been persecuting them. You have been giving your vote against them. And when they were being stoned to death, you would hold the cloaks of people who were stoning my disciples. Don't you understand what you've been doing? You've been fighting against God. They're on the road to Damascus. If you will, Saul of Tarsus came face to face with Jesus Christ. It was necessary for Jesus to appear to him, to qualify him to be an apostle. So that he could go out and preach as an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. And it was there on the road to Damascus that Paul or Saul of Tarsus met Jesus Christ. And that was the moment in which it was made known to him that he was indeed the son of God that he had been persecuting. In 1973, I came to the conclusion that the University of Texas wasn't going to give me a bachelor's degree. And I also came to the conclusion that I was not a serious enough student to earn a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas. My, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, worked for U.S. Steel down in Baytown, Texas. And they told me, come and move down to Baytown. They're hiring at U.S. Steel. You can live with us until you make some money and can get your own place. And so I moved lock, stock, and barrel down to Baytown, Texas in 1973. Moved into the extra bedroom of their apartment, went out and interviewed with U.S. Steel and was hired. And they sent me for my physical, which I commenced to flunk. Found out for the first time that I was partially colorblind 
and I was also partially tone deaf. And that pretty much explains some of those off-key sounds that you hear from the front pew up here from time to time. And so I was not given that job by U.S. Steel. I was going to be a chemist. I was actually going to work in the chemistry lab. I had enough credits in chemistry from the University of Texas that they were going to have me work in their chemistry lab, but that didn't materialize. It just so happened that my sister's husband also knew a fellow that worked at a shipyard in Houston, Texas, and he got me a job at the shipyard. During all of that time, I also met Jean. She and my sister were very best friends. They taught school together at Ross Sterling High School in Baytown, Texas. And they introduced me to Jean, and Jean and I started going out. And from the very beginning, Jean invited me to attend worship services with her, which I did because that's what you do when you're dating somebody and you want that to continue on, whether you believe what they're what they believe over there, whether you believe they're teaching or not, you go anyhow, don't you? Just so that you can keep that relationship going. And so here I am, a good Baptist, going to the Pruitt and Lobit Church of Christ. By the way, just as kind of a little side note to show you how small the world is, Brother Larry Ray Hafley that will be standing right here next week this time was the located preacher at the Pruitt and Lobit Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas for 14 years. So we have a pretty close connection from that perspective. I began worshiping or going to the worship services with Jean, and it just so happened that the first time that I went with her, they were having a gospel meeting, a revival, is what I knew it as a Baptist. But they were having a gospel meeting. The very first gospel preacher that I ever heard in my entire life was Porter Wagner. And those of you who know Robert Jackson know what I mean by that. Brother Robert Jackson was a wonderful gospel preacher. He preached for the church or one of the churches in Nashville, Tennessee for almost 40 years or maybe a little over 40 years. He looked just like Porter Wagner. He had the same slight build, tall and thin, had his hair combed back just like Porter Wagner, had the same skin tone as Porter Wagner, and he wore western cut suits so that he looked like Porter Wagner. He was even mistaken for Porter Wagner. A lady at the airport one time asked him for his autograph, thinking that he was Porter Wagner. But at any rate, I was listening to Porter Wagner present lessons on the five points of Calvinism. Now, being a good Baptist, that's exactly what I believed. Except this guy is standing up telling me that that's all wrong. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. I actually thought that Gene had talked to Robert Jackson and said, listen, I'm dating this guy and he's a Baptist. Could you preach some sermons to show him that he ain't right? And I honestly thought that Robert Jackson preached that series of sermons on the five points of Calvinism right at me. Now, the Pruitt and Lobit Church at that time had a membership of about 280 people. There were in excess of 300 people every night in that uh, gospel meeting, but he was preaching right to me. That's what I thought. But you know what? I didn't listen to him. Well, that ain't right. That's not what I've been told all my life. But you remember I said that I was working at a shipyard? Every day at lunchtime, two of the fellows that I worked with there at the shipyard, members of the Jehovah's Witnesses denomination, would sit together, eat lunch, and read their parade and awake magazines, not parade, awake and watchtower magazines. And they would discuss what they read. And so for whatever reason, I have no idea why, but for whatever reason, one day at lunch, I decided, I went over there and I asked them, I said, can I sit in on this with you guys? And they said, sure. And so they were discussing something that they had read and they mentioned something about what one must do to be saved and I just popped up there like I'm supposed to, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I knew that that was in the Bible somewhere because Gus Hayworth and Albert Martin had used that passage of scripture hundreds of times. 
I might not have been really listening to them, but I heard that verse of scripture practically every Sunday. Did not know where it was. I just knew it was in the Bible somewhere. That's Acts chapter 16, verse 31, by the way. And I said, that's what you have to do to be saved. It says right there, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. I said, no, that's not right. One of them stuck his New World Translation out to me and said, would you read James chapter 2 for me? Well, now I'm on the defensive. <laughs> they've, they've challenged me. Well, I don't know anything about that Bible of yours. That thing might be weird or something. Well, it is. <laughs> I did not know that at the time, but it is. It's not really a translation. They said, well, read it out of your own Bible. Well, I had my Bible in my car because I was dating Jean, and I went to worship services with her all the time. I got my Bible, I opened it up to James chapter 2, and I read it. Hmm. I ain't never heard nothing like that before, Nick. All the time I've been saying salvation by faith only, and here the Word of God says not by faith only. And so I told him, I said, you know what? I, I've, never, I've never read that before. I've never even heard that before. I'm going to need to study that and think about that some more tonight. And he said, okay, that's fine. So I went home that evening and I read James chapter 2 probably more than a dozen times. Over and over and over and over. And you know what? I've watched the show Secretariat several times and he wins the triple crown every time. <laughs> and I read James chapter 2 over and over and over and over several times and it said the same thing every time, not by faith only. And I came to the conclusion before I went to bed that night, Bill, you've got a decision to make. Either keep listening to what Gus Hayworth and Albert Martin told you, or you need to start getting into the book for yourself. Consequently, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is, is that that was my moment with Jesus. At that moment, I came face to face with Jesus Christ, if you will, through the Word of God. And I am here to affirm to you this morning that every single person at some point in their life have to come face to face with Jesus Christ through the Word of God. You have got to understand that just like Saul of Tarsus, you're fighting against God, you're in sin, and you're making the cross of Christ vain and of none effect by your disobedience. And you need to come face to face with Jesus. And you get to need to get to that point to where you understand I've got a very important decision to make here. And so Paul tells Agrippa about that decision in verse 19. He says, So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. And so Paul tells Agrippa then how he went about getting into Jesus Christ. <coughs> in my study with Elaine this morning, I was making sure that she understood when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, that he meant that our only hope of salvation is him, the man, Jesus Christ. And that some way or another, the scriptures teach us that salvation is to be found only in Jesus Christ. And so some way or another, we need to get into Jesus Christ. So I went back the next day and I told these two fellows that were Jehovah's Witnesses, listen, I, I really read, I studied, I thought long and hard about that passage of Scripture, James chapter 2, and I came to realize that I just need to do some studying for myself. I just need to find out what the book says myself. And as I continue to worship 
at the Pruitt and Loba Church of Christ, now I began to listen to what the preacher was having to say, and I was taking notes, and then I would go home, and I would study what he had to say from the Word of God for myself. Because I had made the critical mistake of listening to Baptist preachers tell me that salvation is by faith only when the Word of God says the exact opposite to that. I was not going to make that mistake anymore. I was going, even though these fellows that I've been listening to are given book, chapter, and verse, I decided I need to take notes what they're saying, and I need to study that for myself in addition to just my own regular Bible study to find out what the Word of God actually says. And in doing that, I came across Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, which tell us that the way we get into Jesus Christ is to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And when you read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, you learn that that's the way that you are gaining entrance into the death and the benefits of the death of Christ. You are baptized into the death of Christ. And in the waters of baptism, by faith and the answer of a good conscience toward God, your sins are washed away and you rise in newness of life. Now a new creation in Jesus Christ. And then Paul concluded his defense by telling King Agrippa, let me tell you about my life after Jesus. And that's what he does in verses 20 through 23. But kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both the small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. <coughs> Paul said, King, here's the deal. I was so enraged at this man Jesus being a good Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I wanted him dead just as much as your family did. I wanted him dead just as much as your great granddaddy did when he had all those infants destroyed. But you know what? I met him face to face on the road to Damascus. He told me I needed to go into the city of Damascus and there I would be told what I must do. And I was not disobedient to him. I went into Damascus, saw this, found this fellow by the name of Ananias. He told me his name. He even told me the street that he lived on. And this man, Ananias, told me that I needed to arise and be baptized and wash away my sins. And so that's what I did, King. And ever since then, rather than trying to put his disciples to death, I've become one of his disciples. And not only am I one of his disciples, <coughs> but I have a fervency of spirit in teaching people and telling people that he is the Christ, the Son of God. So much so that that's the reason why these people want me dead. They hate me as much as they hate Jesus. They hate me as much as I used to hate Jesus. But Agrippa, I haven't done anything like they are accusing me of. As a matter of fact, the teaching about Jesus that I do includes the writings of Moses and the prophets because they all spoke about him. Four months after I obeyed the gospel and was baptized into Jesus Christ, <coughs> I went to Keith Sharp, who was the located preacher at Lobit. 
And I said, Keith, do you think it would be possible for me to preach a sermon? He asked the elders, and they said, yes, that would be okay. And so four months after I obeyed the gospel, I stood before a crowd of about 280 people. And I preached my first sermon that I entitled, Are You a Christian? Six months after that, after having preached a few times in between, Keith went back to the elders of the church there at Pruitt and Lobit and said, I think that Bill is showing great promise. He wants to be a preacher. Would the church be willing to support him full time for one year so that he can give full time study to God's word and study with me? And they said, yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. So I quit my secular job at the shipyard and the church at Braytown supported me for one year with the stipulation at the end of one year you either find a church to work with or you go back to secular work. That's just the deal. But I studied and I preached for that one year and then January the 1st, 1978 I stood in the pulpit at Lockport, Illinois for the first time as the located preacher there. 22 months after I had obeyed the gospel. I preached there for eight years. And then I sinned against God and against my family. And I turned my back on God and my family for 16 years, as you all know. Finally, in 2003, the prodigal came to his senses. And I came home to God. I was out of work. I moved back down to Texas. And while in Texas, I worshiped with the West Side Church of Christ in Colleen, Texas, where Brother Seth Ward and his family worship right now. Small world. After two years there, I decided that I wanted to see if I could not get back into full-time service to God. I called my very, very dear friend, Bob Dickey, who was so elated to learn that I had returned to the Lord. And I told him, I said, Bob, I'd like to get back into preaching, but nobody knows me from Adam's house cat. <laughs> you know, a lot of people know you. If you ever hear of a church that might be looking for a preacher that you could recommend me to them, I'd really appreciate it. He said, Bill, you know what? I'm getting ready to hold a weekend meeting up in Hammond, Indiana at the Hessville Church of Christ. He said, I know those folks there very well. I'm going to recommend you to them. And he did. It wasn't too long after that that I got a call. I'd like for you to come up and preach for us. I'd like to meet you, talk with you. I came up, I stayed with Dale and Deanne and their boys. I preached for them. My whole family came that, that Sunday. The Lord put my family back as only he could. Gene came over. Amber and Rob came up. Meredith and Rhett came over from Elgin. The whole family came. And I preached. And a few weeks later, I got a phone call. And it was asked this question. Bill, how do you feel about becoming a Hoosier? Well, first of all, what in the world is a huge you anyhow? Because <laughs> maybe I do and maybe I don't. You know? <laughs> now, I know that you're not going to believe this, but I think Dan and Dale can verify this for you because it was on speakerphone. I was speechless. I had nothing to say. I couldn't say anything. Well, now you will believe this. I just started crying. Four months. Four months. After I decided to get back into full-time preaching, after having been away from the Lord by that time for 18 years, or a, 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 away from preaching and that sort of thing, a total of 18 years. In other words, nobody knew Bill White. But four years after deciding I wanted to go back into full-time preaching, God put me in the pulpit at the Hessville congregation. And now I stand before you. And that's my story. 
That's my story. Now, what I would like to know is what is your story? What is your story? It might not be that your story is as encompassing in all the things that I've talked about. Hopefully not. But I suspect that your story is just as interesting and maybe more so than my story or other people's story. But what is your story? And are you willing to share it with people? And so what I'm asking everyone who is a member of this congregation this morning is to share your story on Facebook. Not only church's Facebook page, but your Facebook page so that it can be broadcast as far and wide as possible. To share your story about you coming to Jesus Christ. That you coming face to face with Jesus Christ. And giving your life to Jesus Christ in obedience to the gospel. And I have created this, this Yahoo email page, if you will. And I'd like for you to write it down. It's watch your story underscore. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's an underscore there. HCOC at yahoo.com. And when you tell your story on Facebook, tell folks that there is free Bible study material where you worship that's available to anyone who would like to have it. All they have to do is just send an email to that address and they can receive free Bible study materials, which would include free CDs or DVDs of sermons as well. And let's see if just telling our story to people cannot invite some folks to write and say, I've got an interesting story too. But I would like to get some of that material you're talking about. So that we get the opportunity in person perhaps. And brethren, let me just very quickly say this. I don't care if we get an email from China. All we're wanting to do is share the story of Jesus Christ with the world. That's what that WWW stands for, the World Wide Web. Let's share it. Let's share our story with the world. Because your story of how you came to know Christ is very likely going to touch the heart of somebody who has had a similar life to yours. At any rate, let's share our experience with Jesus Christ. My question again this morning, right now, for everyone who is here, what is your story? What chapter of your story are you in? Are you still before Jesus? Have you never obeyed the gospel? Are you still fighting against Jesus? Are you still kicking against the goads? Have you met Jesus? Have you come to realize that you need to get into the book and find out what Jesus wants you to do? Are you in Jesus Christ by being baptized into Him? Are you walking faithfully with Him and serving Him or have you allowed your commitment and fidelity to Jesus to grow cold? Can we help anyone this morning write a beautiful, beautiful chapter to your story of making a commitment to Jesus Christ? And if we can assist you, let us know while together we stand and sing this song. Yeah.